Uh, welcome to this event. I'm just going to wait until a few more people join uh, and then we'll get started in a moment. So we'll just wait probably a couple of minutes or so. Okay, well, I think I'm going to get started and uh, welcome everyone to this side event organized as part of the European Business and Nature Summit 2021 and it's designed to scale up business action for nature. Uh, I'm Martin Harper and I'm BirdLife's Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia and I'm happy to be chairing this session today. For those of you who don't know BirdLife, we are the world's largest civil society conservation partnership with 115 national partners worldwide and 45 partners in my region, including partners in all the EU member states. The purpose of this side event is to explore and showcase some practical solutions to problems that businesses face when trying to move towards a nature positive future. I'm going to first provide a little bit of context uh, and then I'm going to introduce the panel. So many of you have been participating in the summit over the last couple of days and as was made clear and clearly is now publicly and even politically recognised, we are in a climate and nature emergency and wildlife is in trouble all around the world and two reports that BirdLife has released recently have highlighted the scale of the crisis across our continent. The new European Red List of Birds highlighted that one in five species are now at risk of extinction and new analysis about the change in population abundance has shown that there are now 600 million fewer birds across the, U the EU and indeed the UK than there were 40 years ago. And indeed, this, these are the latest stats that add to the assessment made by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services when they produced their report in 2019, warning that a million species are at risk of extinction unless we take rapid action to transform our economy. And the key message is that if we want to maintain the health of our planet and of course our own species, then business as usual is not an option. It's why we wish the climate, the Glasgow Climate Pact had gone a bit further than it did and why we are calling for tough new targets to be agreed at next year's UN Biodiversity Summit in China to help us secure what we've been calling for a net zero and nature positive future where we have decarbonized the economy and ensure that there is more wildlife tomorrow than there is today. And the draft global biodiversity framework currently includes targets to protect 30% of land, freshwater and sea, um, restore 20% of degraded land and recover threatened species, but also for business to halve their negative impact and indeed to increase positive impact for nature by 2030. Yet agreeing the right ambition is just the start. This then needs to be translated into laws, policies, and practical solutions. Now, some nations, and indeed the EU itself, have already started to reflect this emerging ambition in their own plans and laws. And, and it is heartening to see the new EU biodiversity strategy, which of course many of you are familiar with, and that includes some very clear targets, including the desire for no deterioration in the status of species, and at least 30% of species reaching favorable conservation status by the end of the decade. So we all have a part to play in meeting these new targets. And as was said yesterday, 
we need to move beyond doing no harm and move towards restoring biodiversity. It's why the UN has declared this the decade for ecosystem restoration. So how do we practically make this transition and how do we make it easier for businesses to become nature positive? Well, in this session today, we're going to look at a case study about how we're making it easier for one sector, the extractive sector, to play their part, particularly in protecting wildlife during the working phase of a quarry operation. Uh, and to guide us, I'm going to be joined by three excellent speakers who will offer their views. I shall introduce each before they speak, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, so you know, you can see but not participate in the chat, but if you want to ask a question, please do so using the Q&A button, which is at the center of the bottom of this screen. So our first speaker is Nadine McCormick. And Nadine spent 15 years with the IUCN Global Business and Biodiversity Programme and currently works as manager for Nature Action for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, leading on science-based targets for nature, nature-based solutions guidance, and mobilizing business leadership. Nadine will set the scene about what nature positive should mean for business and how they can build that thinking into their strategy and into day-to-day -day operations. Over to you, Nadine. Thanks, Martin, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. I trust you can see my slides well and clearly. I don't have many slides for you, and those of you who are on the session this morning might have seen these um, as well this morning, but I would take a slightly different slant today um, or for this session just now. So yeah, really welcome the discussion. So the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is the um, a large uh, business association, more than 200 leading member companies who are working together to transform the system to get to a nature positive, net zero and equitable world as well. Um, and as Martin said, I joined WBCSG just earlier this year in March. And I have to say one of the first things that happened was on my desk was put a draft paper, which was the global goal for nature. It's like, well, what's that then? <laughs> Where does this come from? And having worked on net positive impact at site level with different uh, companies when I was at IUCN, my first question was, well, how is this the same? And how is this different to what we've been doing before? So a number of our member companies were like, okay, what does this mean? Help us understand. I'm putting together a process um, that we could all learn together. So what I'm gonna give you today is a snapshot to kind of help set the scene of what nature positive means for business linked to this global goal for nature. I'm not gonna go into like the details of it. I'm gonna highlight some parts that are gonna be hopefully relevant for the discussion today. Um, and then there are other opportunities to go into the detail another time. And also it's quite helpful in case you are ever asked as well, you know, what does nature positive mean uh, as well? I think as we're increasingly getting more traction linked to net zero. So these are again, not, there's a very familiar curves here to those of you who are probably on the call today, like why we need to start taking action on climate and on nature because even despite our best attempt over the years and arguably decades, the curves especially for biodiversity loss are still going in the wrong direction. And so a group of individuals, I think it was around the Davos meetings uh, coming into nearly three years ago, said, well, net zero is gaining such traction for focusing corporate action and financial institution action on climate. Can we come up with the equivalent for, for nature? And so the idea is that we need to both halt the loss of nature and reverse the loss of nature. And as Martin said, just very simply, it means having more nature um, uh, in the future than we do now. And so what they came up with was this global goal for nature, which as you can see, they talk about bending the curve. This is where it comes from. So really, yeah, reversing the, like the stopping the loss of nature and then putting back more. So it's reducing the pressures that are leading to loss of nature and looking for positive contributions and to put some numbers on it, because we, you know, we need numbers and business especially needs numbers around. So thinking about zero net loss of nature from 2020, aiming to be net positive by 2030 with full recovery by 2050. So there's lots we could dive into. There's a paper, um, the Global Goal uh, for Nature Group. You can dive into that for more details. I think what you take away from this is this is a systems level goal. This is not necessarily thinking, you know, just at sites what we're quite used to, but it's actually thinking at sites, at projects, um, uh, across businesses, at, different, at landscape level, at national and ultimately planetary levels. And so how does this all add up so we get to full recovery by 2050? And also um, 
yes, you might be sat there and thinking, well, that's going to be very difficult. It's like, yes, it's, but it's what's needed. And so it's a little bit like, you know, the 1.5 for the planet on climate, it's going to be challenging, but that's where we need to get to. So we need to get to net positive by 2030, even if, you know, we feel that it's quite a, a challenging goal. That's really the level of ambition that's needed. Um, to help business then, for, then understand what this means for them, through this dialogue process, we quickly realized that, you know, we don't want to be adding to the complexity here. We already know there's so many initiatives that are mushrooming up as this movement around nature positive. And so to try to uh, keep aligning with those initiatives, there are a number of steps that companies are becoming more and more familiar with when it comes to understanding their relationship with nature. So whether it's from the Natural Capital Protocol in, from 2016, which in the Capitals Coalition then put together in a beautiful infinity loop of how the steps from business in blue on the left feed into financial institutions, which feed into government and then back around creating this positive loop. Um, the SBTN and their initial guidance they picked up on those steps in the Natural Capital Protocol and, uh, and their guidance towards setting targets for nature. And then Business for Nature and what they do in such an excellent way is really distill the, the essence of these steps. But simply, I mean, they, the, 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 the steps that are needed are kind of been known and they're, you, know, you might call them slightly different things, but they are logical. What's different now, though, is with this global goal for nature, it's not just about um, what, uh, what steps we need to take, but how far and how much. Um, the, the SBTN will be developing uh, definitions uh, for business contributions in different eco regions, but that's not due till next year. And so the idea is to come up with some guidance to help um, show the level of ambition that's needed um, so that business can already start taking action. So what you have in front of you now is the one slide on nature positive for business. So if you're asked uh, by your boss, um, you know, can you give me a one slide overview on nature positive? Well, here you go. Um, the idea is then looking at those steps which are familiar, so assess and prioritize, commit, measure and value, act and transform, as well as then disclose and report across all of these, what does the global goal tell us to do differently? So again, there's a lot of detail I could dive into and that's not the intent of this call today. I spoke a lot about assessing and prioritizing this morning on the session. I want to draw your attention to the acting part, because again, here's where we see some convergence that amid the mitigation hierarchy, this has traditionally been applied at the site level when it comes to biodiversity. It's something that we can actually start considering now, not just within, you know, within operations, but also along the value chain. And so to think about business decisions to help avoid, reduce, as well as restore and regenerate. So thinking about the halting to avoid and reduce, and then having positive contributions that are reversing to restoring and regenerating, and then getting this to add up along the value chain, ultimately to transform the system. Um, but yeah, I, I think part of that, the measuring and valuing piece then will then actually follow the actions that you're taking. And certainly the maturity that we're seeing of companies or their typical entry point is around that avoiding piece and maybe some of the, the, the reducing through sustainable practices. And that cutting edge piece is now, well, then how do we put back more? Um, and, uh, and then how do we demonstrate that? And then how does that get reported on through the value chain? So of course the devil is in the detail and I think the, those building blocks really try to provide a strong, credible basis as we all start now talking about nature positive that we do so in a way that doesn't devalue the term that net zero has kind of seen as well if it's been misused. And so we're trying to kind of be um, coherent um, um, on our messaging around nature positive, but then we quickly need to start being very specific about what this means. So some of our next steps will be diving into this for some priority sectors, as I've identified by the World Economic Forum and BCG. So land use as it relates to agriculture and forestry, built environment and energy. Um, and the idea is then to actually start going into a level detail there. So what, what are the material issues because of impacts and dependencies that are SBK is saying? How does that translate through to what a company should prioritize for their goals and targets and what they should be measuring and especially the actions that they can be taking um, across the value chain and then getting ready for disclosures which are coming you know with the TNFD that's been established and then I appreciate that is really a whistle stop tour and what nature positive is quite a complex term but trying to distill yeah the 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 tip of the iceberg of course the, this these were based on uh, existing frameworks that are out there already what we're trying to do is kind of create that navigation tool to help companies who are dipping their toe in the water to come in at the shallow end and be coaxed to come a little bit deeper into some of them, the very, the very detailed guidance that exists from SBTN, from the IUCN, 
um, from BirdLife and from another of the partners as well. If you're interested in kind of diving into this and actually practicing as well, speaking nature positive, then you're welcome to sign up for this session that we're hosting next week on the nights for an hour and a half with breakout rooms and everything to really enable you to actually practice and uh, speak to some of the owners, let's say, of some of these frameworks, which really underpin the building blocks there. So yeah, sharing that in the spirit to kind of help set the scene of what we mean by nature positive with respect to business, you know, how the level the, of ambition has raised, but also how it's building on frameworks that we already know. And let's start from, you know, those breaking down those, those blocks, those pieces of the puzzle, which are, um, uh, yeah, where we already have experiences, we're going to find out now and then use that experience and build on for that to kind of build change at scale that's needed. So thank you, Martin, back to you. And thank you so much, uh, Nadine. You've set the scene superbly. And uh, yeah, it's one of those new terms that we're all going to have to get our heads around and make sure it bites. And I think yeah. that is the critical thing. Um, so um, you'll see Nadine again at the end um, when we have a Q&A session. So you may have lots of questions for her. Um, but we're now going to move on to our second speaker, who's Dr. Carolyn Jewell, uh, and she is the Senior Biodiversity Manager at Heidelberg Cement, uh, and she's been supporting the development of a corporate biodiversity strategy, which, you know, is a move towards a nature positive future. And one of the things that she tries to do is to mainstream biodiversity throughout the company. Um, she also sits on a number of sector association working groups on biodiversity uh, and is just all around a great champion for biodiversity within the sector. And so, as I said at the beginning, what we're going to be doing is really concentrating um, as on a particular case study in the extractive sector. And what Carolyn is now going to do is outline some of the successes and challenges uh, that this sector has faced in delivering nature conservation objectives and where the company is on the nature positive journey. So over to you, Carolyn. Perfect, thank you. Let me just... Hopefully this works. Or is it on the presenter? Not quite there yet. Maybe one more press. Here we go. Good. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Carolyn Jewell. I work for Heidelberg Cement. Heidelberg Cement is the largest vertically integrated building materials producer in the world. Um, and I mean, what does that mean uh, when it comes to nature? So that means that we work in a number of different landscapes uh, across the world. Um, we have over 800 quarries. We're in over 50 countries. Um, so for, from my point of view as an ecologist, this, this actually creates quite an exciting um, area to work in because we interact with so many different habitats and species. And um, what I want to do today is um, picking up on the building blocks that, that uh, Nadine has presented, um, look at one of the challenges that has actually uh, come up with the fourth one in terms of ACT. So um, Heidelberg Cement um, really has biodiversity listed as one of the material issues for, for our company. Um, it's embedded within our sustainability strategy. We have a number of core corporate targets, uh, in particularly um, understanding our net impact on biodiversity. So we've already done a lot um, on the first three building blocks um, to understand uh, what, what, uh, what the priorities are in terms of our interaction with nature and, and how we go about understanding and measuring. But I really want to focus on the ACT. Um, acting for me is, is very important. We all need to do actions on the ground if, if we're really going to start to reverse this, this negative trend. And we're always looking in Heidelberg Cement for ways in which we can contribute to nature, have a positive impact above and beyond what our corporate targets are. Now, I was starting to hear stories from my colleagues um, in, in many sites, particularly in Europe, um, that they were coming up with some um, issues in terms of, of uh, conflicts with nature. Um, and I just have this one slide because I'm hoping that uh, a picture really does tell a thousand words. And what, what we were finding in the quarries is that um, during the active phase, uh, we often have um, top, uh, topographical features that actually promote biodiversity. So as the trucks drive through the quarries um, on a set route uh, throughout the winter, they create, create these depressions. 
Um, or we may have um, high rainfall and water collecting in, in depressions, as you see on the right. And it doesn't take nature long um, to, to move in um, and uh, start to make these places their home, and particularly uh, endangered species or protected species. And so what we were finding that, that during the normal active phase of a, of a quarry, we were starting to see the development of these temporary habitats. Now, from a, a risk point of view, um, for us, this, this was a great concern because, of course, as soon as a protected species moves in, then there's massive concern over what this means in terms of legalities. Um, could we potentially have to stop operation because they're there? Um, and the trend was that, that people were trying to leave their quarries more to the situation in the picture on the left. So uh, the, the quarries were devoid of vegetation. Um, if, if areas were um, filling up with water, they were um, filled in to stop that water collecting. And we ended up with a very sterile environment, um, which, OK, it means that we can continue with our business, which is good. But, but where does nature go? And there's so many few opportunities now in the landscape for uh, species that, that need these pioneer habitats. And we thought, well, this, this is a real waste. Um, there could be such an opportunity um, for nature to thrive in, in these active situations. Another example uh, was San Martins. So um, San Martins quickly colonize um, over very short periods of time into faces, uh, sand faces, or even stockpiles. Um, I was in a, in a quarry in France uh, not too long ago, and um, there was a stockpile right in, in the middle of the working area, um, the processing plant, and um, there were uh, nesting sand martins, and I said, oh, you know, what, what happened here? Um, because, of course, they want to sell, sell that stockpile, um, and it had, it had actually happened over the weekend, so um, on a Friday evening, um, the site had been left, the stockpiles had been prepared to a, um, a slope angle which would not be suitable for St Martins. Then on the Saturday, um, there was a, an extreme rain event, um, which of course we're seeing more and more these days. And the slope had um, had full, had come down. It created a much more vertical face. And on Sunday, the San Martins moved in. So on Monday, of course, that that could that material was now protected and could not be sold. Uh, sold. That in itself not a problem at all. That's something that we're we're happy to manage, and we are actively managing this throughout throughout our quarries. But the issue comes when we want to um, close that site and we want to reclaim it, and perhaps it will be reclaimed to a forest, there will be no habitat for those San Martins to then um, live in. And this was actually causing a regulatory issue. And um, we were being asked to provide mitigation for, uh, for these temporary habitats. So again, a legal risk, an actual issue that was stopping us from actually promoting nature in our quarries. So um, we, we see, many people see quarries as the, the restored quarries. What can we do after? Um, and I, I very excitingly heard this morning that one of our former quarries is now being the site of a reintroduction for beaver in the UK, which is, was really exciting and really shows the value of the habitats that be, can be created. But can we do more in this ACT building block um, to actually provide for nature during the active working quarry? So this led to many discussions um, and uh, we, we've had the partnership with BirdLife for um, a decade now, um, celebrated the, the 10 year anniversary this year. So we started talking with BirdLife about, is there something that we can do to solve this problem? Is there something, some mechanism we can put in place whereby we can actually increase the, the value of, of our active quarries for nature? So benefiting nature, but not having issues in terms of um, legal risk for our, ourselves in terms of operations and continued working. So that hopefully presents the challenge that we had. Um, so we started well, uh, talking with BirdLife about this, this framework, and I will now hand back to Martin, who will go into more detail about what the framework actually looks like. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Carolyn. Uh, yeah, so we've heard about the overall framework about Nature Positive for Nadine, and then Carolyn has outlined the specific challenge uh, around the creation of these temporary habitats um, in quarries. And so what I'm now gonna do 
is I'm going to try and uh, talk to you about the solution that we've developed, um, because what we don't want is for species protection legislation to become a barrier to companies wanting to do good things for wildlife during the operation of a quarry. Um, uh, so th the solution we came up with is the publication of a species protection code of conduct. Uh, and one of my colleagues is going to put um, the link to this in the chat box now. And this was published in October. Uh, and it was developed and supported by um, not just BirdLife, but also SEM Bureau, which is the European Cement Association, Eurogypsum, the European Gypsum Association, and UEPG, which is the European Aggregates Association. And as Kaz said, um, Heidelberg were crucial in making this happen. And as well as the actual practical problems that Kaz outlined, um, the, in many ways, the origins of this issue sort of find itself in the fitness check of the EU nature directives of 2016, which concluded that the laws were fit for purpose, um, but improvement, improvements could be made in the implementation. Uh, and at the time, BirdLife's feeling was that this really required a sector by sector approach because the issues facing forestry or agriculture or housing was actually different to some sectors such as the um, extractive industry. And so that's why we worked with um, our longstanding partner, um, Heidelberg, to, to develop the code. And um, I've noticed one of the questions in the chat box coming in now, and you know, clearly we differentiate between the three different stages of the life of a quarry. So the consenting process, which leads to the initial clearance of the site, the operational phase and then the reclamation and restoration phase. Uh, and actually, I, I, I think that these three phases, um, uh, the, the NGOs have, have interacted with these phases in very different ways over the last few years. So for, 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 for many years, and this is probably going back two and a half decades, the key thing for NGOs was probably to challenge where these quarries were going to be consented in the first place to make sure that they were not um, constructed in places which were really important for wildlife. Um, and while it's certainly not, you know, absolutely perfect now, there has been a maturation of the legal framework across Europe, which has helped to improve the citation of, um, of new quarries. Uh, and I think the industry itself has changed and reflecting this change, NGOs turn their attention to collaborating with quarry companies like Heidelberg um, to restore lost habitat after the quarrying has been completed. Uh, and across Europe now, there are numerous examples of where quarries have been turned into fabulous nature reserves. But the missing piece of the puzzle has been this collaboration to support nature conservation during the quarrying phase itself. Um, which actually, as Kaz says, can be of real interest. Um, so whether it's uh, bee eaters finding their way to nest in a, in a new cliff or orchids appearing or the magical arrival of amphibians finding homes in temporary pools, a bit like the sand martins, it, they can be really important for these pioneering species just looking for habitats to, um, to, to, to flourish. And we would love more companies to cherish these temporary habitats during the operational phase of a quarry. But, you know, um, as, as Carolyn said, it can create a bit of a headache for operators who might be concerned about their additional cost um, or indeed the bureaucracy associated uh, with looking after these species. And so that's why we've developed the code of conduct. Um, it's designed for quarry companies, but it's also um, hopefully going to be used by national authorities. And there really are three key elements which are crucial to this code. First is, to respect the law, uh, including the mitigation hierarchy throughout the lifespan of a quarry. And uh, this applies as much to where a quarry should be sited in the first place, all the way through to closure. Uh, and so avoid no harm, mitigate or minimize impacts, and then compensate for lost habitat. And then the second uh, key feature of our code is really to use the derogation process, which is permitted under the relevant articles of the Birds and Habitats Directives to basically provide temporary habitat permits, whereby the company commits to allowing the biodiversity which has colonized this new habitat in exchange for a derogation which allows for the removal of those temporary habitats once the sensitive period is over, whether it's breeding season or hibernation, and once that's been completed, and then the time can then be um, found to start to proceed 
with on-site activities again. Now, the third key element, as well as the respecting of the law, using the derogation process well, is to then ensure that ideally all operations comply with a site biodiversity management plan, hopefully designed to achieve nature positive outcomes throughout the whole life cycle of a quarry. So they are the three things that we think are needed and the conditions that need to be in place um, are particularly for the national authorities to embrace this, uh, but also to support it by investing in monitoring uh, and data um, and, ge and generating data really to assess the impact of any activity on the status of a given protected species. And clearly it's easier to make this assessment where you sort of know what you're aiming for. The technical phrase is the favorable reference value for any species. Because if you know the likely impact on a population, then you could determine the scale of the compensation that's required. So what we want is we want this code to serve as a practical guide for the extractive sector to help companies make the biggest difference for nature, even during the operational phase. And as I said during the in my introductory remarks in the whole session, we need to find ways to make it easier for businesses to do the right thing and to become nature positive. And, and my, my, in my experience, this starts with the leadership and every business committing to embrace the principles that Nadine outlined in her presentation. And then of course, constructive engagement, hopefully from the likes of NGOs, and we can be quite challenging at times, but also governments to try and find these creative and practical solutions to overcome the obstacles that businesses might face. And finally, it requires businesses to be really honest about the challenges that they face and also clear about where they are on the journey. And the best way of doing that, I believe, is in, I think it's the uh, third element of Nadine's hierarchy, which is really monitoring and reporting publicly on progress, showing clearly where the, um, the progress is for any company in meeting their targets for nature. So what I've done is I've given you a practical solution and that we're offering. And now I'm gonna hand over to our final speaker, who is Maxime Selek. Um, he's gonna talk about how the new code can work in practice. Uh, and Maxime is part of the uh, Gemblo uh, Agro Biotech Unit at the University of Liège. Um, he's passionate about biodiversity and he's worked for the last five years as a senior scientific coordinator for Life in Quarries Project, specializing in the implementation and monitoring of temporary habitats. Um, so he's obviously going to come with a whole load of pragmatic ideas to try and help wildlife on site. And so he's brilliantly placed to talk about how this code can work in practice. So over to you, Maxime. Well, thank you for the introduction. Can everyone see the screen? Can you see the screen? Is it? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so indeed, I'm going to present you some concrete example of uh, what we've been doing that is following the, the code of conduct, but also the new EU guidance, but also I, I believe contributed to these uh, two uh, new outcomes. And we are working as in the picture here uh, within the operational phase of the, of the quarries. So the Life in Quarries project is a partnership uh, before everything. It's the partnership between a university, uh, an administration, well, a regional administration, a nature park, NGOs, uh, representative of uh, bird life in, in this case, Natagora. And uh, these supporting actors are supporting the life project coordinator, which is uh, the Federation of Extractive Industry for the Belgium, for Belgium. Uh, so our main goal is to deliver sites that uh, present a current network for biodiversity with core populations of species, but also acting as stepping stones for uh, some others. And in doing so, we, we defined first uh, targets uh, that were relevant at the regional level. Uh, either species that are protected under EU uh, legis or directives or that are protected under uh, regional uh, legislation, either species and habitats. So uh, further, further on, we find you tune this at the local scale by uh, de developing biological inventories and uh, defining well stakes that, will, that were relevant at the site level. 
And uh, further on, we proposed and implemented some actions, actions that consist uh, in two types of actions, temporary and permanent. The temporary nature uh, actions are represented on, with a little video here, and that's the core business of the Life in Forest project. Uh, things that can move along with the exploitation and favor uh, temporary and transient habitats for temporary species or pioneer species. So when, after developing these actions, we've been, uh, as is, is uh, promoted here, has been promoted here by Martin, uh, we've been monitoring the, the outcomes and well, we've got some quite positive results with uh, uh, our two main target species here, the natterjack and the midwife, uh, which are really relevant to temporary nature that got on really well on, on uh, these sites. And, uh, and also uh, to, well, in fact, this doesn't go along uh, as simply as as it, as it, it is said, uh, you to to make sure that this will live on live on in the future, we also transform the sector stance through trainings, and uh, we did that through the whole chain of command from the top management to workers, with uh, different uh, trainings that have delivered some positive results. So you can see on the graphs here uh, that. The, the evolution of the commitment to protection of biodiversity is uh, important within the quarries. It was already important at the beginning, but it, it uh, increased during the project. We also, uh, to further allow for uh, commitments to improve, we provide positive feedbacks to the sectors with a better image of the sector, uh, allowing for better communication towards uh, the layman's. And uh, well, in the end, these uh, commitments are also uh, incentivized by uh, the new guidances that have been developed by the EU Commission, uh, EU Commission, yeah, and the Code of Conducts that uh, is definitely a, a masterpiece in terms of temporary habitat management in the future. So, thank you for the scene. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Maxime. Um, and thank you to all speakers. I think my colleague might put us all on the screen now. Uh, hopefully we'll all turn up. There we are. Uh, so, okay. So uh, we've, what we've tried to do is we've tried to explain the challenges that businesses face in trying to move towards this nature positive agenda and recognizing that there are some real commercial challenges. Uh, and so we focused on a particular specific example of a challenge that the extractive industry faces and how we've tried to overcome that with you know practical experience and 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 essentially guidance with, the, with our code of conduct so this is really your opportunity to ask questions um and um, um in a moment i'm going to pose a general one to nadine but i'm also going to go to the chat box i think it's only fair that we do ask um we we allow uh, lean's question to be um addressed and i'm going to start actually with this question poses to you, um, Carolyn. All these examples from Heidelberg are about nature coming back to an existing quarry. What about new quarries and the nature that have dis disappeared for those or are no new quarries opened anymore? So do you have any comment on that? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the focus of this really was on the active phase because um, as Martin pointed out, a lot has been done on, on um, the opening in, in terms of understanding the mitigation hierarchy and the due diligence process that we go through when when starting new quarries although um, certainly there is um, a preference for extending now rather than than actually opening new ones um, however um, this this part of the the life cycle that the opening is also picked up in the code of conduct so the code really does look at the whole life cycle um, and it's very clear, um, again, that, that the mitigation hierarchy is, is followed, um, that um, we understand exactly what is um, in the landscape before opening a quarry and that the, um, uh, if, if we can't avoid um, 
uh, it, it's not always possible to completely avoid because you can only work where the mineral is um, and we need the mineral for society. It's not, it's not a luxury. Um, we rely on, on um, cement and aggregates for, for everything um, in, in this life um, these days, for whether it be schools or roads or houses. Um, so we have to work. Uh, we have to extract and, and a lot of work is being done um, on uh, the circular economy. We're looking at recycling, a huge amount of um, research and innovation is going into this, but, but at the end of the day, we at the moment, we still need to take material out of the ground. Um, but but we, we follow the mitigation hierarchy, we understand where, where we're situated, um, we regularly sub subscribe to the IBAT tool, Integrated Biodiversity Assessment tool, so we can regularly um, evaluate where, uh, where we want to work if we were to open a new one. But as I said, um, we, we need to know what's there, um, we need to mitigate, um, and again this is picked up in the, in the Code of Conduct. Martin, you're mute. I must get some sort of fine for that, especially as the moderator. Um, I apologize, everybody. Um, thank you, Carolyn. I, I was going to actually throw out a general question to Nadine, because this may be one of the first times you've heard in detail um, the work that we've been doing with one of the sectors, the extractive industry sectors. And I just wondered if you'd had any reflections on what you've heard as to how it sort of is how consistent it is with the vision that you think um, you're articulating to businesses in the future and just any reflections you've got really and then I'm going to go back to the chat box. Yeah no fantastic I think um, what I really appreciate about the examples is that the devil is in the detail and so yes I presented these really six like high level messaging but then we need to bring it down in a consistent and coherent way and then yeah, when it comes to systems change, right, this is massive and everything is connected, but actually what we need to do is break it down and be very clear on what the barrier is. And so, you know, what I hear from this is like, we, there is an opportunity to have positive contributions, this reversing the loss side, but what's in the way is the legislation. Okay, but then we need to focus on that and prioritize and get that barrier out of the way. Then there might be another barrier that comes along and that's fine, we'll deal with that when we come. And I think it's as Caroline says that um, like, it's through actions we can actually change things. That's a really cool acronym, actually. ACT, A-C-T, action changes things. Like if we actually don't change action, nothing changes. So I really like this about diving into the detail. What do we want to do? What's getting in our way? And having dedicated um, approaches to dealing with that. And actually Maxime presenting then as well. Well, how we need to engage differently, whether you're speaking to a CEO compared to whether you're speaking to the, the operations or the, the management team in between. Like, so everything, we need to break it down to the level of detail about who we're speaking to, what sector are we in, um, how aware of the issue are they? And like not going in and blowing them out of the water with something that's super detailed when they're like, nature what? So really, I think it's, it's a great example of being very precise in our action, having very targeted um, action to get the change that we need to see bit by bit. Thanks. And thanks, Nadine. Um, there, uh, there's a a question which I think flows actually from what you've just said. Um, it's just come in really, um, it's saying, it's clear what's been presented that the code of conduct, which appears to be a policy commitment is also actionable. Has this been one of its strengths and what was key in making this possible? I suppose that question is trying to draw out, well, what are the lessons that we can learn from this experience, which we can transfer to other, um, you know, other solutions? Um, maybe I'll just, I will ask Carolyn and Maxine to offer any comment on that. What, what do you think made this possible and what can we learn from it? Um, so um, from, from my point of view, we, we heard earlier um, in, in the closing plenary that it, it, it needs to be simple and we need to collaborate. And I think this has been really echoed within the development of this. Um, um, simple may be a harsh word to use because it, it wasn't simple and it's taken a lot of time and a lot of hard work, but, but essentially, the, the result is relatively simple when, when it's put into place. Um, basically, we're allowing nature to thrive in quarries. That, that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the target. And um, we, we know what species we can enhance. We understand the landscape. We know it's these pioneer species. So it's very clear on the target. It's, it's relatively simple. Um, and I think what, what's been really exciting about this is, is the collaboration point of view. You know, okay, the problem came um, highlighted from Heidelberg Cement, but, 
but it's a it's not an issue that's uh, unique to Heidelberg cement. It's unique um, an issue that's um, really faced by the whole extraction sector. And the fact that the associations have come together across Europe, I think, is really powerful. Um, and that's that's not only powerful for for getting um, more actors to, to take this on, but it's also powerful when talking to the Commission. And the fact that we've been able to get this um, endorsed by the Commission for me is is really really powerful. Um, and again, it, it shows that that working um, to take a, a very um, a powerful, strong voiced NGO such as BirdLife Europe, and to combine that with the business movement the whole U European extractor sector to come up with a document to to really put this simple solution forward has has really been the, the key in, in, in making it work and um, I mean it, it is just the beginning we have a lot of work now to do on the ground um, to get it um, really mainstreamed into international legislation it, it is just the beginning but I, I think it's really exciting and it, it's a great example of what business can do if they put their mind to it, if they're very key on their priority, if they're key on the issue. Um, and I, I hopefully, I'm, I'm really hoping that other business takes inspiration from this uh, within their sectors to, to come up with some other um, innovative solutions that we can do to, to really increase biodiversity in our landscapes. Great, thank you, Carolyn. Maxim, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe add that, uh, well, at the beginning of the day, every, every uh, quarry workers or uh, well every quarry manager wonders what can I do and that was the issue within the life in quarries project we we were training some people before prior to the project and then they were going back to the quarry and wondering uh, how do I act now and and what can I do and we are well all of us actually with Nadine also and the life in quarries has demonstrated it in practice but the code of conduct uh, provides a sequence and so do the, the EU guidance. We are all providing a sequence to act and to define a, a starting point and a finishing point that, that will uh, secure uh, investments from, from in time and in machines or in, in uh, well, in, in risk also. And uh, that will, well, Re reassure uh, maybe the, the sector in finding a, a way to enter uh, the process and to deliver actions that are coherent with the, with the rest. Um, thanks, Maxime. I can see Nadine's hand is up. Um, Nadine, I'm also going to ask you the question that Sarah Zimmerman has put in, which is, how do the building blocks relate to the natural capital protocol? And is there any variation on the on that approach. So um, if, yeah, so if you could deal with both, that'd be great. Love to. So I, I just want to just build on um, what Carolyn and Maxine were sharing there, bringing the point that you said earlier on as well, Martin, like I wonder what what, what also made this a success is, um, well, one word I think is like focused as well, like being very focused. Okay, what's the change we want to see? So we want biodiversity within active quarries, what's getting in our way? and being very focused on that. And then that focus actually became a, a common purpose between traditionally opposite sides. And I'm in the tradition and I'm using my inverted commas here. One of my favorite subjects at IUCN was actually the conservation community fearing to dare, you know, to reach out to the business community, business community fearing and actually seeming to be antagonistic. But at the end of the day, you realize there's a common purpose, a common focus. So it actually requires a different way of engaging as well. And, and this is not just, you know, a philanthropic type engagement. This is not just a, you know, a, a bashing in the press. This is actually, do you know what, this is tricky and none of us have the answer. We need to come together. And um, I had a lovely quote from one of our member companies of the day. If we want transformation in our value chains, we need transformation in how we collaborate as well. So this is a different way of collaborating. And I just, I think it's just a great example, Martin, you were kind of alluding to that as well. Like we actually need to show up differently to how we collaborate to get over some of these tricky challenges, but with that focus and common goal. So I just, yeah, I was just reflecting on just what you were saying there as well. I, I think for me, that's also maybe one of the success factors as well, which we need to apply as we get down and break down the next puzzle pieces that we need to kind of start working on. So anyway, just one reflection, and then I, I might pause there before I go on to the next one. Like yeah, no, I, actually just, I, I'm just gonna add one tiny thing, which is it, it, it does actually 
all require the sector to want to change as well though and to recognize there is a need to do more for biodiversity uh, and i think um, many sectors i think have embraced the decarbonization agenda uh, and are beginning the pathway to do that obviously not as fast as we would like but actually i don't think enough businesses and sectors have actually embraced the biodiversity challenge yet uh, and so it does require there to be an acknowledgement that there is a problem in the first place so um, that would be the only additional thing I would add to that. So Nadine, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to just pose this yeah. question back to you again, yeah, which was um, from Sarah Zimmerman about um, the relationship between what you presented and the natural capital protocol. Yeah. Can I just build one more thing, what you said actually? So yeah, for me, um, what I talk about a lot is um, some of these challenges are technical, yes, and how do we measure, how do we value, et cetera, which will be my segue in a minute to the natural capital protocol. But often this is also a change management issue and back to that, you know, changing companies and changing individuals. And so if there isn't an awareness of the change and a willingness to make the change, there's no point then coming in with your 100 page guidance and how you need to solve this. And so you're absolutely right. There has there's been a journey over the years and the likes of BirdLife and others who've been raising that awareness, plus the business case, you know, that there is increasing investor pressure. Uh, well, consumers that okay, came very far down the value chain are asking questions, local communities are asking questions. So all that is contributing to that and like, leading businesses are actually going, yeah, we need to do this and the other businesses following as well. So yeah, anyway, that's another whole discussion, but I should get to Sarah's question. So yeah, really good point. I think one of the slides um, I tried to show of like, there are existing frameworks that are out there already. So the natural capital protocol, I didn't show that particular famous slide of the 10 different steps of the three different phases. Was it four? Um, but the steps now they've actually translated into this um, this infinity loop where the steps of assess, prioritize, uh, commit, measure, value, act, and then and then the report and disclose how that then feeds into the financial institutions. And so, really, that paved the way the natural capital protocol that was 2016, so it's five years ago. It's been already picked up and adopted by the SBTN, the initial guidance. So they built on that as, the, as uh, they uh, provide guidance for how companies to start setting targets and no regret actions for on nature. And so these building blocks, I think what was missing though, is that's like the how to, but it's still not like how much. And so we still don't have precisely how much, but we certainly have a direction in terms of what's how much. And again, it's actually quite simple in the end. It's very intuitive. We need, we need more nature in 2030 than we did in 2020. Yes, we do need to get to the stage of being able to measure it, to have the credibility, et cetera. But that was missing. It's not that it was missing, we just didn't have it. And so what we've done is we've taken those existing steps, which are pretty much encapsulated in the natural capital protocol, and then added on this how much. And so it's, you know, to say when we think about nature, it's not just about species. There's there's other elements of the, the living components, there's the ecosystems, the species, the genes, and they show up across different realms of land and freshwater and oceans and well, there's also the climate part, but we didn't get into that bit yet, but they're connected too. And so being holistic in how we think about nature, but then specific based on what the, the material issues are for the, that sector and that place in the value chain. So it's what it is, it's, it's an iteration and building on the natural capital protocol. So hopefully not adding to confusion, but we're trying to you know, iterate in this very fast moving space. Brilliant. Thanks, Nadine. Um, so I've got another question which is the term nature positive implies was also mentioned to be more than essentially more tomorrow than that we have at the moment um, and the question is whether this could be linked to the EU restoration agenda for those of you on the call who are not aware uh, the EU as part of its biodiversity 2030 strategy has committed to establishing a legal legally binding target um, for nature restoration uh, and hopefully that um, proposal will emerge I think Stefan Leiner from the Commission said March next year, um, but I suppose the question is: Is there is there any specific links to the restoration agenda out, outlined for EU and Nature Positive agenda? Um, Carolyn, can I just start with you? Any comments on that? Yeah, sure. So I I think it definitely can. Um, the only um, uh, hesitancy I have for our sector is that, that we don't confuse nature positive with um, net positive impact. Um, and I, I think it's, it's very clear that, that that's, that's something that, that we have to address first and that nature positive is, is a bigger overarching. Um, and, and we really need to 
um, through through our, our reclamation, um, through the work that we do on the ground, we need to make sure that we are um, taking into account historic impact um, and, and that we really aim for net, net impact. So that would be my only can, kind of uh, hesitancy with, with linking this to the restoration agenda. Um, but, but certainly, um, I mean, the, the, the work that's highlighted in this code is, is not related to that. It's really related to the active um, phase and what um, sort of temporary restoration we could do, but, but not only temporary restoration, but how the quarry forms a stepping stone for the, the wider landscape restoration, I think is really important. So from that point of view, um, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, I just, yeah go on, Nadine. I say build, building on that. So yeah, again, if we come back to this nature positive is this kind of systems, a like bigger planetary level goal that we're aiming towards. And so what we've heard today is, I don't know if that's a million piece jigsaw puzzle, what we've heard today is one of those puzzle pieces which fits into the ones around it as well and suddenly on its own and then net positive impact at the site level on its own isn't enough you like just to kind of re-emphasize those points Carolyn was saying but that said it's an important piece and one that's quite established now and that actually can help inform other actions and again back to that mitigation hierarchy so SBTN they they have slightly modified the the, the terms which again uh, which now apply to different levels of the system. So site level has its own specific mitigation hierarchy. They talk about avoid and reduce, then restore and regenerate. So it's A3R or T or something, because there's the transform part as well. And so the avoid and reduce are very critical to halt the loss of nature. The restoration and ultimately getting to regenerative approaches are important for the reversal and these positive contributions. So in the rush to kind of think, okay, let's about restoration and regeneration, let's not also forget the important part on avoiding and minimizing. That needs to keep going. So the restoration part needs to come on top of what we've already been doing and make sure we keep doing. So avoiding those areas which are critical for, for nature, for people, for climate, um, and there's minimizing in terms of reducing the pressures as well as looking at restoration. So I think, and, again, it's complementary. It all fits together. Yeah, and, and Nadine, we at this point, I know it's all we're, all we're all learning about how we apply this world, but would you be advising companies to set targets for each of those different elements, um, the avoid, the reduce and, and the restore? So essentially, as part of any framework, whether it's yours or the business and biodiversity crowd or whoever, um, the, essentially this setting targets um, to then be able to take action, report against publicly, um, do you propose that that we, we should be set, companies should be setting targets for each of those elements? Uh, avoid use. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, and that's a, that's a logical way of kind of looking at it, and actually just thinking systematically. Well, what for where we are in the value chain? What does it make sense for us to put our efforts on, or be asking our suppliers to do? Um, and again, um, and those targets been related to, but what's materially important for our company as well? And so that's why those steps should theoretically link together, but it's quite iterative as well. You can't. Again, it's back to change management. You can't do all of this overnight in one go. And so think about those critical areas, start prioritizing. Carolyn mentioned the IBAT tool is a great tool to start prioritizing. Okay, so where, where are our direct sites and where are we sourcing from? Are they critical for nature and for climate? And let's prioritize there and what does avoid and minimize look like there? And then we can also start thinking about the restoring and generating. So there is a bit of a sequence into this too. And especially, you know, if there are some quite major uh, contributions to pressures on nature in the supply chain to not just go straight to restoration but do avoidance first and minimizing and then start thinking about restoring and regenerating so yeah well brilliant look thank you so much um uh, nadine carolyn and maxime for giving up an hour of your time to really just yeah we were trying to showcase a practical solution to a problem that has been identified by one of the sectors who are trying to move towards a nature positive future to try and play their part. And uh, I hope you all found it useful and interesting. Um, it just, you know, please do cut and paste um, the two links in the chat box so you can look at the uh, infographic on what nature positive means for business and also to look at the um, code of uh, conduct as well. And I think, you know, the messages I take away from this is um, any business needs to recognize there's a problem, they need to then start going through the stages of assess, commit, act, advocate, change, uh, and then creatively collaborate to try and come up with solutions to practical um, 
problems on the ground. Uh, and then if we all do that, then we'll make the world a better place. So with that, I'm just going to say uh, a massive thank you and uh, no doubt see you again on another webinar very soon. Take care. Thank you, Martin. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.